There's going to be a little boy at your door for long, probably. And uh, <laughs> if you need any help, just call me. <laughs> oh, my. <laughs> oh, I've watched these girls grow up. My, what a blessing. And uh, Wow. It's a pleasure when you can stay somewhere long enough to do that and watch them grow in the Lord. And God used their abilities and talents. And uh, it's a blessing. I started before I was out on the Beatitudes in the Gospel of Matthew chapter 5. The more and more I study these scriptures, I realize the more uh, fitting they are for the day in which we live. I begin to search my heart and search the Lord's mind. And uh, a couple of times I backed off and said, well, I don't know that I need to preach this. I don't. Uh, I think that it, we might get in a rut, but at the same time, I keep gleaning truths, and the Holy Spirit keeps showing me things. I think He wants all of us to see. If you look, I've entitled this series "The Recipe for a Blessed Life." In Matthew's Gospel, chapter five, verse one through verse four, we'll be reading this morning. It said, "In seeing the multitude, he went up into a mountain, and when he was set." His disciples came unto him, and he opened his mouth and taught them, saying, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are they that mourn, for they shall be comforted. Pray with me. Father, thank you again this morning for the infallible, inspired, and errant word of God. I thank you, Father, today, Lord, for the prayers that have been prayed, the songs that have been sung. And Lord, I realize it's come now for the appointed time to preach the word of God. And Lord, I pray that you wouldn't let me stand here alone, but I pray, Lord, today, I pray for your presence and I pray for your power. God, help me to take the things today that you've placed in my heart and I've jotted down here and recall them and, and just bring forth the message you've laid on my heart. Lord, you know every heart, every life, Lord, that's in this building today. And God, I pray today that, Lord, that you'd speak to us loudly and boldly that we might respond now to the call of God. For it's in Jesus' name I pray. Amen. If you, we looked at verse 3 in a past sermon, uh, we discovered that Jesus is speaking there in verse 3 uh, on total dependence versus total independence. As he said, blessed are the poor in spirit, for though theirs is the kingdom of heaven. But now in verse 4, uh, let me remind you as we look at these verses, there's eight particular times here he uses the word blessed. In these beatitudes, just a reminder uh, of this word "blessed." Uh, it means to be full of joy. Uh, it means to be congratulated. In other words, uh, the Greek word "makarios" meaning to be self-contained, um, to have what you need within you, and that's what Jesus is the reason to use this word. You have what you need within you uh, to to live out the attributes He's speaking of here. So he says, blessed are they that mourn in verse 4, for they shall be comforted. Blessed are they that mourn, for they shall be comforted. Well, the first beatitude really is intellectual. The second is the emotional aspect of the same thing. It's poverty of spirit that says, I am undone. It's the, mourn, the mourning which this causes that makes, uh, makes it break forth in the form of a lamentation. Let me illustrate that for you in Scripture. If you remember the book of Isaiah, Isaiah, as he looked around, he saw the, uh, the dilapid generation which he lived in. Uh, and in the fifth chapter, there was five different woes there that he mentioned. There was all types of things that he denounced that he was dealing with. But he goes to the temple, to the house of God. He's seeking something and he realizes that he needs the presence of God. And there in the midst, he begins to bow before him as those angelic beings show up there. And he realizes and understands that he too is guilty just like that generation that he lived in. And he made a statement there in chapter 6. He said, Woe is me for I am undone. I am cut off. Uh, in other words, that's exactly the mindset that we've got to find uh, here in this fourth verse. Blessed are they that mourn. It means to get to a place when you realize just who you are and you realize how holy God is. You realize who you are and who He is. Uh, somebody said that this verse could really mean uh, happy or the unhappy, uh, the gladness of sadness. 
uh, or somebody has titled this particular verse, God applauds you when you're in agony. Well, I don't know about all that, but uh, this verse really basically deals, uh, as verse 3 deals with, excuse me, <clears throat> verse 3 deals with total dependence versus total independence. This verse particularly uh, deals with deep mourning versus carefree irresponsibility. You need to remember that. Jot that down somewhere. Deep mourning, okay, as pictured in Isaiah's uh, uh, experience in the, in the temple with God, uh, uh, and carefree irresponsibility. Now, as I thought about that, I listened to Jack speak this morning. He gave me a thought here uh, as I listened to him teach. You know, we want reward and riches with no responsibility. That's our culture. We want reward and we want riches with no responsibility. Uh, and if you understand what he's saying here in this third verse, fourth, fourth verse, excuse me, he said, Blessed are they that mourn, for they shall be comforted. Let me give you this parallel. As we examine deep mourning, okay, versus carefree irresponsibility. What does that carefree irresponsibility look like? I've just given you one statement, but let me just picture it for you just a little deeper. You see, the world says, who cares about sin? The world said, who cares how I live? It's none of your business, church. Preacher, you don't have any, you don't have any right to question me. Uh, and and uh, the world says, I have a right to do what I want, to live the way I want to, to go where I want to go, no matter what you think or what anybody else thinks or what anybody else says. That's what he's speaking of in this particular verse. And that's the world. That's the world that we live. We face a world that's full of carefree irresponsibility. In other words, it has the mindset of you live your life, I'll live mine. Don't bother me and I won't bother you. I'm reminded of a story I read about a little girl, a young teenage lady, young lady actually uh, in New York City by the name of Kitty. Uh, she was brutally stabbed to death uh, in her neighborhood in the cul-de-sac where she lived. Uh, there was 38 neighbors who listened to the, to the violence. They watched as her uh, boyfriend began to abuse her. Uh, he began to attack her in a series of over 90 minutes. They stood by and they did nothing to help her in the situation. Let me relate that to us today. We've got to be very careful we don't do that in the spiritual realm. As I think about that today, folks, many people think that we can go through uh, life Life changing our conditions and it'll result in a change of character. Well, that's not so, folks. Until we see people's hearts change, their lives will always fail. Until we see people's hearts change, we will always fail. When we, until we see our hearts change, we will always fail in this thing of being what God wants us to be and living this blessed life. You see, we live in the mentality today, folks. Uh, we think we can, uh, if we can change the exterior, then somehow we can manipulate the inner man so that uh, he or she won't be bothered by God. We think if we can get our hair cut, uh, we think if we can buy the right kind of clothes, move to the right kind of neighborhood, or get out of the, a, wrong, a wrong environment, if we can think if we can take, move, do all those things to better ourselves, the environment we're in, folks, listen, uh, it doesn't work. In other words, this, this particular scripture is showing us that we have to mourn and we'll be comforted. Well, I'm getting somewhere, so stay with me. In other words, we think we can change the exterior and manipulate the inner man so we won't be bothered by God. Let me give you an example. Take a car, for example. We can, we can buy a car... And we can buy a car that has some deans and, and blumper, uh, blunders about it. We can fix it, pull all the dents out, fix all the dents, sand it down, take out all the rust spots, put on fresh paint, uh, paint the outside, put on new tires, armor all the tires, buy ni nice wheels. But then we never see under the hood. It looks good. It shines. Oh, it has a wonderful appearance. But this particular car has 350,000 miles and it burns a quart of oil every time you go to Walmart. You see, we've changed the outside, but we still have a problem within, don't we? Our car might look its best when we're broken down on the side of the road. Oh, it looks good, but the inward parts are still failing. It looks good, 
It looks good, but we live under the strain every time we go out and we're wondering and worry whether we're going to make it home or not. We see what he's doing now he, in this particular beatitude is he's showing us the grief that consumes us. The grief that consumes us. Look what he says. Blessed are the poor in spirit for those of the kingdom of heaven, but blessed are they that mourn. Uh, you see, we fail to realize, folks, and I gave you that introduction to show you this. We fail to realize when we sin, we have sinned against God and His Son, and there should be a spirit of mourning. That's where He's getting at. But if you're living with a life of, of irresponsibility, you're never going to take the individual responsibility for your sin. And we've raised a generation, we want to blame it on somebody. We want to blame it on the school. We want to blame it on the environment we were raised in. We want to blame it on our teachers. We want to blame it on our parents. We want to blame it on this and we want to blame it on that. But the bottom line is, much of it is our own fault. When we sin, folks, we got to need to realize we've insulted God. And there ought to be a spirit of mourning. The idea here is we need to be realized that, listen, sin ought to bother us. Sin ought to bother us, and we get to the place today where it doesn't bother us. You see, the word mourn here in this particular scripture uh, refers to a very strong Greek word, uh, which means to lament. Uh, it's used to describe what you might feel at the graveside of a loved one. It's the word which describes sorrow. Now, there are two basic kinds of sorrow. There's godly sorrow and there's worldly sorrow. Godly sorrow involves remorse. Godly sorrow involves remorse. Worldly sorrow involves regret. Regret is in the mind. Remorse is in the heart. Remorse looks at sin and its consequences, but remorse leads to repentance. And the factor that we left out today in our culture is we have left out repentance. We're sorry we may have sinned, but that but we never get to the place where we're so sorry that we, 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 we confess it and we repent of it. We polish it. We make it look better on the outside, but it's still, listen, it's still right into the core on the inside. We've got to get rid of it. We've got to empty it out. We've got to confess it. We have to confess it and repent of it. Now here we've got to ask a question. We have to ask a very serious question this morning in this particular verse. And here it is. Do the things that break the heart of Jesus break yours? Do we have a dry-eyed church in a hell-bent world? 2 Corinthians 17 says, For God is sorrow, work with repentance. To salvation. You see, folks, the haughty heart and the tearless eyes should be foreign to the Christ follower. I look around, I've spent a lot of time the last couple of weeks sitting around, most of the time on ice, watching different things. And, folks, there's a couple of times I just teared up. And I said, Dear God, how do we get here? How did we get here? I can't turn my TV on without two men locking up or two women. It's every single channel, every family program we have now is endorsing it and pushing those things down our throat. You hear this old time preacher, I'm not going to compromise. It's wrong. It'll always be wrong. I love everybody and I want to help everybody I can. But there's some things in the Bible, not just that. There's all types of other issues that we see all through our world today uh, in the media and all across our land today that's been accepted. And you and I are the only voice that's going to speak up. Nobody else is going to. There's some things, ladies and gentlemen, that ought to make us mourn. There's some things today that ought to uh, that break the heart of Jesus and they ought to break our hearts. Listen to what the late Dr. Adrian Rogers said, I quote. He says, we have learned not to mourn. So many of our church services are pep rallies filled with cheerleader enthusiasm. We're doing everything we can to avoid mourning. We have psychologists to numb our neurosis, counselors to resolve, uh, to resolve our guilt, doctors to sedate our pain, insurance agencies to take away our worries, and even at the mortuary we have people to beautify death. He goes on to say we make life one big recreational theme park and take an amusement ride to heaven. I said, wow. 
And folks, he's dead and gone, and we still see that today. You know, September 11, 2001, terrorists extinguished over 3,500 lives. On September the 12th, 4,000 lives were snuffed out. September the 13th, 4,000 more lives were snuffed out. September the 14th, 4,000 more lives were snuffed out. Every day since 1973, over 4,000 babies have been aborted in America. Wow. There's some things that ought to bother us. Folks, when we see that we're spiritually bankrupt individually and as a nation, it's time to mourn. Well, understanding that, we see the grief that consumes us. But now, the Lord begins to speak about the God who comforts us. And I'm glad for that. He said, Blessed are they that mourn, for they shall be comforted. You see, once you see the guilt and feel the grief, then you can know the grace. And what we've done, we've tried to bypass the, we've tried to bypass in our culture. We've tried to bypass the guilt and the grief and experience the grace. But you'll never experience the amazing grace until you, listen, until you come face to face with the guilt and feel the grief of your sin. And then you can experience grace. We've tried to take uh, that out of our culture and out of our church settings. You see, the word comfort is a very interesting word here. You find in verse 4, and they shall be comforted. Uh, the word comfort is not a word for sympathy, folks, but it's a word for strength. The word calm means with, and fort means strength. Uh, it describes a fortress. It speaks of fortification. Uh, it speaks of, uh, to, uh, to fortify. In other words, God says, listen. Uh, he said, when you mourn, when you mourn, when you become uh, at grief over your sin, your sinful condition, when you get to that place, he said, when you get to that place, when you literally collapse and realize you can't do it on your own and you realize your irresponsibility, he says, listen, I'll give you strength. I'll be that fortress for you. I'll be that one that lifts you up. I'll put my strength in you. I'll not only put my strength in you, but I will be your strength. Wow. Pretty good offer, huh? Well, how does God impart to us His strength? i tell you how He does it. He does it by the indwelling and the filling of the Holy Spirit. Listen to what John's, the Gospel of John, what Jesus said there. Remember what Jesus said? He's getting ready to ascend into heaven. And He says in John chapter 14, verse 15, He said, if you love me, keep my commandments. And I will pray. Look what He, he said, I'll pray. He said, I'm going to pray for you personally. Why? Well, look what he's going to pray. He says, I'm going to pray the Father, and he shall give you another comforter, uh, that he may abide with you for a couple of weeks, or until you blow it, until you sin. That isn't what it says, is it? He said forever. Amen. Amen. He says that he may abide with you forever, even the Spirit of truth, whom the world cannot receive, because it seeth him not, neither known he, knoweth him, but you know him, for he dwelleth with you and shall be in you. I will not leave you comfortless. I will come to you. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Jesus. You see, the word, uh, he talks about this comforter, this uh, Greek parakletos. It means to come alongside of. It means to attach to. Uh, it, 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 it's actually the same word we find over in other places. It, it, it's the word advocate. It's the same word. It's the word which means to come alongside of. Jesus is our parakletos. He is our comforter. He is our advocate. He's constantly going before the Father, uh, listen, con uh, confessing our sin and forgiving us our sin for us. Well, let me come to a conclusion this morning of this particular message. Blessed are they that mourn, for they shall be comforted. You see... When you trust the Lord Jesus Christ as your personal Savior, you quickly learn that there's some things that will break the heart of God. That's the Holy Spirit's responsibility to show you what those things are. And He will reveal to you the things not only that break the heart of God, but they also break your heart as well. You see, the dangerous place we get to is when we think that our sin doesn't affect anybody else. 
and we become irresponsible in our walk with God. And that's what this verse is dealing with. That's what this beatitude is saying. You know, and I, I thought about that. Let me just say this this morning. When you say things and do things and live in such ways that you get to the place where you didn't care whether it affects anybody else or not. And by the way, it doesn't really affect God. You're in trouble in the heart of your Christian life. You're in trouble. You're in deep trouble. And I think that's where a lot of Christians have gotten today. We think we can... I'm, call, I'm talking all across America. I'm amazed at some of the things that go on today in our churches. I, I'm amazed. We just do what we want to do. <laughs> when we want to do it, how we want to do it, and we don't get any counsel from the Word. That's the culture we live in, folks. And I know I'm not popular. I, I'm okay with that. <laughs> But when God called me, I made a commitment. I made a commitment I was going to preach His Word. I grew up on preaching that was topical. He might, I might have a verse read here in chapter 5, verse 2, and be way over yonder Noah's Ark and somewhere uh, having Jubilee and never understand and make an application to my life. And when God called me, I said, listen, I'm not going to be a dead, bored Christian. I want to grow and develop and be what God wants me to be. And listen, and I'm going to help others to grow and be what God wants them to be, to live with character and conduct that reflect the Lord Jesus Christ. And I've kept that commitment. By the grace of God, I'm going to continue to do that. And no, it's not always easy. And you can still do it with love and compassion. And that's what Jesus is doing here. He's showing us the recipe for a godly life. Why in the world? If Jesus gives us a recipe, why in the world would we follow it? Now, it's okay if you're cooking not to follow it, okay? Some of you look at me funny. You don't know why? Because I don't usually. I develop my own recipe. I'm going to use that for illustration. That's what we do. We want to develop our own recipe. There's some recipes I've got. My grandma taught me how to make cornbread, old time cornbread and that old black iron skillet. I mean, you got to do everything just right so it won't stick. It's got that crusty bottom brown on. Oh man, it's like, oh honey, you put that in some milk or some pinto beans. It's out of this world. And you will never, I say, listen, if you do your pan right and if you mix that batter right exactly the way that she gave me that recipe, I fixed it for years and you'll never have it stick. And it'll always be just right. But you go to tampering with it just a little bit. You go to tampering with it a little bit. You get in a hurry and you try to leave something out. You see, those are the times that it didn't come out the way that it's supposed to. And I learned very quickly after the first time I did that, there's a reason she did this and there's a reason she did that. As I make that spiritual application to that, you see, we've got to be careful that we don't ignore the recipe. He's told us how to live this blessed life. Why? Because He wants your life to be blessed. He wants you to be happy. He wants you to be joyful. He wants you to be excited about the things of God. When all of, all of our culture, listen, has gone ludicrous, he, you can still have that peace and that happiness. You can be in a place when the bottom falls out around you, when there's death and there's sorrow and there's pain and there's difficulty. Listen, you can still walk in the stride of a holy God. Well, here's the question. You see, there's a comfort of knowing that you're clean and clear in your walk with God. I'm glad that I can raise holy hands this morning because I've got a heart that's clean. You don't know why? Because every single day I know that I blow it. And I have to fall on my face before God and say, God, give me grace to be what I need to be as a Christian, as a father, as a husband, as a grandfather, as a pastor. God, help me. And if there's anything in my life, anything in my life, God, help me get it out. There's comfort of knowing that you're clean and clear in your walk with God. The question is this for all of us this morning. Do you find yourself moaning instead of mourning? 
There's a lot of folks moaning and whining and complaining and trying to change their situations. Listen, when we ought to be mourning, falling before God and saying, God, help us. Help me. Help me in this situation. Help me to be what I need to be. You know, what Jesus declares as blessed are the things we spend a lot of time trying to avoid. <laughs> Humility, mourning, gentleness, persecution. I could go on and on. Let me come to four truths. She's going to put them on the screen as I close this morning. Number one, God draws near to those who cry. God draws near. Now, I'm not talking about you got to go around everywhere being a big crybaby. I'm not, I'm not talking about that. Some of you men aren't going to like that too good. I'm just wanting to talk about. What I am talking about is a sensitive spirit. In Psalm 34, verse 18, he said, The Lord is nigh unto them that are of a broken heart and saveth such as be of a contrite spirit. Your spirit needs to align with His spirit. There's some things that break God's heart and they ought to break your heart. There's a, we, uh, God draws near to those who cry, who have a tender heart. Folks, we live in a day of, listen, of hard-hearted people. He draws near to those who cry. Every now and then it's good somewhere to get, just get along with you and God and just say, God, I, I'm, I realize how pathetic I am. I realize, listen, without you I'm nothing. You see, you've got to be low to be made high. Number two, God uses suffering and sorrow to draw us to Himself. Psalm 34, verse 4, He said, I sought the Lord and He heard me and delivered me from all my fears. Well, I'm sure I'm glad there's some times that I was in situations of suffering and sorrow. I didn't have anybody or anyone, anywhere anyone to look to. And I'm glad I looked to the Lord. And I'm glad He heard me, aren't you? And He delivered me from all my fears. You see, you, you can lay your head down every night today, ladies and gentlemen. You can lay your head down every night and not have to worry about where you're going to spend eternity. The grace of God will take the fear of dying out of your heart and life. You may not think things like I think, but as I rolled back that hallway the, last week and I knew they were going to put me to sleep, and I've got some issues, I know that, and I had some in the prior surgeries afterwards with blood pressure and different things. But well, there's nothing like without any anesthesia rolling down out of the hallway knowing that if I slip on out of here, I'll be in glory. I'm glad I woke up. But if I'd have woke up, I'd have woke up on the other side. You say, preacher, how can you be that sure? Because I know, I know in whom I believed. I sought the Lord one Sunday night in a little old church of Foothills in North Carolina, and He heard me. I didn't have a nickel in my pocket. I didn't have a famous last name. I, I was, had nothing. But I realized I was a sinner, and I come from the left-hand side of that church that night under the conviction of the Holy Spirit and bowed down, take you to the place, and God the Holy Spirit moved in, and I'm glad when I got up from there, He heard me, and I was changed. I wish I could tell you I've been perfect, but I haven't. You haven't either. There's some places in my life I've blown it. But I'm glad He didn't leave me out there all alone. I'm glad He chastened me. He fashioned me. He molded some things in my life that would draw me back to that relationship and that fellowship that I needed to have. Has He done that for many of you? You bet He has. And I'm glad today God uses suffering and sorrow to draw us to Himself. Thirdly, you realize we grow faster in hard times than we do in Good times. Do you know you'll learn more in the valleys than you will when you're on the mountain? You'll pray more when you're in pain. You'll pray more when there's a death in the family. You'll pray more. You'll seek God when you've lost your job more than you will when you're ready to go out to the steakhouse and, and do the fine dining and, and go on the vacations and the trips. And you see, there's times in your life, in my life, and we grow faster in the hard times than we do in the good times. And then lastly, our pain. God uses our pain to minister to others. Some of you have been through times of brokenness. You've been 
through times when you feel like the bottom's dropped out on your, on your life, financially, maritally. God can use those occasions and those things in your life so that you can help somebody else in the journey. What am I saying in closing this morning? I'm grateful for the God who comforts us. I'm grateful for the God who comforts us. I'm glad. I'm glad today. God help us to be mourners and not moaners. And if you understand the difference, a mourner is humbly seeking God for the answers of life. And a a mourner is constantly complaining about what he or she's going through and left God out of the situation of life. I don't want to be like that. I don't want to be like that. I want to be one who lifts up the name of Jesus. I want to be the one that has it on the outside and I want to be one that has it on the inside. Don't let grief, don't let trouble, uh, don't let situations in your life rob you of being what God wants you to be in your Christian life. Maybe you're here this morning and there's some things today, some situations in your life, some sin in your life. As a, as a, as a, as a man or woman, teenager, whatever it may be, are there some things in your life that really, if you break the heart of Jesus, they've crept in? Are you one of those this morning that needs godly sorrow to work with repentance in your heart and life? If you're here this morning, you've never trusted Jesus Christ, first of all. Godly sorrow work with repentance. God loves you.